It's been quite a journey to find myself back here at the Portland Art Museum, this beautiful grand ballroom. I was last here about three and a half years ago with Cherie, uh, my then wife, who has since passed away. We were presenting our first major fundraising gala for the Psilocybin Services Initiative. We call it Psi 2020 back then, uh, which eventually became Measure 109. And we were a little over a year and a half out from sailing to a historic election night victory in November of 2020, which now sets the stage for the nation's first statewide psilocybin services program. Yeah, set to roll out in Oregon next year. And so, as many of you know, it was just a month and a half uh, after the measure passed in 2020 that Sheree died unexpectedly. So I lost my wife. And the movement lost a pioneer in Cherie Eckert. Obviously, that set me off on quite a grief trip. And I want to thank everyone here who, and the community at large that loved and supported me through that very difficult time. Your support and recognition of Cherie's extraordinary life gave me strength to eventually soldier on and continue working on the vision that she and I so passionately advanced together and that Oregonian, Oregonian so incredibly made a reality and continue to make a reality. So thank you all, deeply. I went on to serve as the chair of Oregon Psilocybin Advisory Board, start a found, started a foundation in, in Cherie's name, and I'm now launching Intertrek, uh, a practitioner program that will uh, graduate license-ready psilocybin practitioners into this new Oregon ecosystem so I've been busy. I also met one Rachel Aiden, who some of you may uh, know in the psychedelic space. Rachel and I became friends after Cherie passed. And about a year later, uh, much to our surprise, things opened up between us and we fell crazy in love. And long story short, Rachel and I are getting married next week. So, <laughs> so lucky, so lucky. <laughs> So I thought I'd talk about uh, how Oregon's campaign and how the statewide program came about and the inspirations behind it, which I think are even more relevant today than when Sheree and I began writing the uh, text of that initiative some seven years ago now. So the origin story of the Oregon campaign takes us back to 2015, which was before psychedelic grassroots policy reform existed. Uh, I do remember the moment that the psychedelic ballot initiative concept first came to mind. It felt a little like catching lightning in a bottle. I had to sit with it, as did Cherie. We didn't take the decision to move forward lightly. We didn't want to jeopardize any progress that was already happening. We understood the history, how fragile it all seemed. And we really wanted to get it right, which is why we always aimed at 2020, even way back then. And so Cherie and I sat on it for a week feeling undecided about moving forward until we realized there was really just one thing left to do, and that is, of course, consult the mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> so we packed up the car, plucked some golden teachers from our little terrarium in the closet, and headed out camping, figuring that a mushroom trip might clarify our decision. And so it was that a mushroom journey on a beautiful evening surrounded by the majesty of Mother Nature sparked the nation's first psychedelic campaign. And our setting couldn't have been better. It was an old growth forest of giant hemlocks and firs at the foot of Mount Rainier in the beautiful Pacific Northwest. And as that ancient forest went dark, the golden teachers kicked in. And in the latter stages of a powerful trip, Cherie and I found ourselves sitting across a campfire. And it was somewhere in that starry soup of shared consciousness that our minds conceived. I remember myself having been quiet for a time. My mind had stretched to a frame that seemed a thousand years wide. Um, I sensed a deep future as if historians from some distant day were peeking back at me through a fold in time which seemed eerily plausible. And um, yeah, I wondered what they saw. I mean, what will the scholars of a truly advanced society 
one that survives a thousand years into the future, think about our civilization. Peering back, what would they see? Now, my sense was that they weren't focused on our politics or technologies or anything like that. I sensed them noticing the state of our consciousness, our lost connection with our inner dimensions, the inner sanctum. And it occurred to me <clears throat> that nothing would appear as vexing to these future scholars as criminalizing the safe, safe and effective means to enhance and explore consciousness. And it was right about then that Shri's voice pierced the quiet. I'm pregnant, she said, with, like channeling from afar. And, uh, you know, this was really curious to hear because, you know, I knew we couldn't have kids together. So I looked at her inquisitively. She said, this idea, this campaign, this, this vision will be our baby. And she had like campfire flames reflecting in her uh, dilated eyes. And like, <laughs> she's like, we'll raise it like a child. We'll care for it until it grows strong. And suddenly I knew we'd do just that and we'd see it all the way through, and that we did. And the metaphor held throughout, it's the way we talked about the campaign, it's the way I sometimes still think about the unfolding statewide effort, except now it's obviously a village, it's a movement, um, raising the baby, sharing the responsibility of bringing this idea into the world. So I'm humbled and proud, remembering Cherie, as she truly believed that Oregon, and perhaps the world, would one day open up to this psychedelic model of care. There's uh, Cherie at what may have been one of our first campaign events. I think that's an old picture. It's amazing to me how, you know, now that psychedelics are all over Netflix and everywhere else, that this little project of ours, which started with nothing but imagination and had no reference points, became this powerful resonant movement. Um, ultimately ending psychedelic prohibition, advancing the nation's first statewide psilocybin services program. Here we are back in 2016, our first uh, summary of the initiative. We took it to the Legislative Council in Salem in hopes that they'd draft up some language for our idea, which to our surprise they, they did help with. And months later we had in hand the first psilocybin draft legis legislation in this country after much refining, we received a certified ballot title through the Secretary of State, which hurtled us into this immense challenge of gathering 165,000 signatures uh, to put psilocybin therapy and wellness on the 2020 ballot. That's uh, Carly, one of our great volunteers gathering signatures. She may even be here today. Um, we had dozens of maybe even hundreds of volunteers. There was. Uh, Ultimately, there was just no way to get all those signatures without hiring a professional signature gathering firm, which required a lot of money. And so, as mentioned earlier, we, Shuri and I took a leap of faith by ponying up about 20 grand of our own money to have a fundraising gala here in this very room. There we are uh, making that happen. And we raised, we raised the money. We, we raised about 80K. We seemed like a lot at the time, and suddenly the whole possibility of campaigning for psychedelics got very real. It was a very exciting and heady time. I have some brief, brief clips from that night. Uh, here's Mark Hayden, who has since become a good friend. He the, was the executive director at MAPS at the time. It's an exciting time. You have just finished having a room full of people that are well-heeled, educated, intelligent, leadership quality people in our society who have stepped up to this room and said that they want psychedelics legalized, and that is absolutely huge. Well, the initiative excites me. This is a, a service initiative. It's not let's legalize magic mushrooms. It's, it's carefully thought through. The language is thought through. It's about delivering this in the right kind of way. This time round, we're going at it with greater maturity and maybe sophistication and maybe for those reasons we're going to deliver this time. So therapy centres, the kind of thing that Mark Hayden was presenting, is, uh, is a really good model I think for rolling this out.
It's an exciting time. You have just. Well, the biggest takeaway is that the science is there and that people are ready for this and that the truth is on our side. So all we have to do is just share with the public what we already know, what the science has proven, what the people are ready for. People years from now are going to look back at this moment and see this is when human beings figured it out. And this is when we really came together with solutions to really maximize and realize and manifest the truth of human potential. It was this night with the Oregon Psilocybin Society. History making crusaders for justice. That's what we're here tonight. People with the courage to tell the truth and the vision to lead the way for Earth to follow. So we started scaling up. Our core team took shape, including myself and Cherie, along with David Bronner, Grant Boyd from New Approach Pack, hired Sam Chapman, our campaign manager, Ben Unger, general counsel. And that lean little team, along with kind of a rapidly growing movement of support, ended up doing some pretty big, big things together. Uh, it wasn't easy though. Things looked kind of bleak when COVID hit. Um, we still had to gather 50,000 signatures without being able to go out on the streets. I don't know how we pulled that off. Um, it was pretty amazing. I won't go into it, but now we find ourselves careening toward election night. Our polling showed that we were still down a few points, but within striking distance. Um, raised a lot of money in the 11th hour uh, from Oregonians, and we got some, uh, the first. TV ads for psilocybin therapy, I'm sure, in the country to pop up around the state. Here's a, here's a quick look from our favorite uh, state senator, uh, Elizabeth Steiner Hayward. Measure 109 regulates a promising approach for depression and anxiety, psilocybin therapy, a medicine derived from mushrooms with access controlled. Measure 109's regulations require psilocybin only be used by adults in licensed clinics supervised by trained facilitators. It's not legal for recreation, it's not sold in stores. A two-year phase in to develop safety, practice, and training standards. Measure 109 promotes safety for a therapy that can help people who are suffering. So I'm gonna jump ahead. I have some election footage, but I, I'm running out of time here. I wanna to get to the inspirations. You know, when I think about you know, the heart of the organ model, it's found in the inspirations that gave rise to it. You know, we, we wanted to harness the power of psychedelics and psilocybin for healing, address the mental health crisis, the prohibition on psychedelic therapy. We wanted to end that, we did. But just as importantly, we wanted to think deeply about how to integrate psychedelics like psilocybin back into the culture. We wanted to put psilocybin therapy and wellness on its own foundation, give it its own licensing framework, truly integrated platform one that can address a spectrum of concerns, from preventative to wellness and therapeutic to medical concerns. And we wanted to tailor that model to the unique quality of the psilocybin experience and all that it entails, which as you guys know is quite a lot. So the Oregon model represents a shift from a more medicalized approach toward a more humanistic and holistic model, a model that orients to our inner resources, our, our innate capacity to grow and mature and even transcend um, recognizes the healing energies within us while connecting us to something greater than ourselves. So is that kind of message out on the campaign trail which resonated because it's empowering and it's true, speaks to everyone equally. And part of our understanding of, as a campaign and as a statewide program now in development is that psilocybin is not just a pharma drug, it's not just a new antidepressant to be brought to market. You know, we see it more through a lens of what it, I think it really is, an ancient, existential, psycho-spiritual medicine, and perhaps even more fundamentally, a real and vulnerable human experience, unique to the individual, yet deeply rooted in our collective nature. And it's not a passive thing, it's your psychedelic experience requiring intense inward participation, which is what, why it makes such a deep impact on the psyche. I think it's why a percentage of alcoholics are transformed, why depressed people see a light, lifetime smokers put down their cigarettes for good, and folks who are dying of cancer can embrace their fate with peace in their hearts. You don't get that with a daily pill or even by talking it through. You get that through direct experience, and that's an experience of deep attunement, wholeness, and of the sacred so for lots of reasons, we didn't want to just hand this over to a strictly pharma-driven medical model. And with all due respect, and so much is due to the heroic science, scientists who rebirthed the psychedelic movement in the 21st century, 
you know, the FDA approval process cannot be the sole source of progress, nor should it exclusively define this container. <laughs> Access to psychedelic plant medicines cannot be restricted to a medical complex. You know, psilocybin with the deeply human experience it activates should not be dominated by pharmaceutical companies or corporations that focus on profit over impact. So a bulwark is the ballot initiative, which Oregon proved by carving out a new space for therapeutic and wellness services, it includes licensing, careful safety practice and ethical standards, and has a backbone of specific training and accountability, while op opening the doors of access to anyone who might safely benefit without needing a prescription or a diagnosis. That's what's going to unfold in Oregon over these next years. So Oregon is showing what's possible here. The measure was an example of creative legislation in that we use legal language and people power to carve out a new space in our culture. And I hope this cultural space expands and, pro and proliferates and helps to create a new narrative around mental health care and wellness more generally on a national scale. I think it will. So I'm proud of Oregonians who came out in force to support this measure in 2020, all 1.3 million of you who voted yes for psilocybin therapy, carrying Measure 109 to a decisive and historic victory with a commanding 56% of the vote, something that would have seemed pretty unthinkable just a few short years ago, except for those of us in Oregon who dared to dream. So thank you, Oregon. Thank you all for taking the time to listen to my story. Thank you for the support over the years then this incredible effort that we did together, I really appreciate and love you all. Take care.